The uneven availability of COVID-19 vaccines has become an increasingly urgent and vexatious issue. But managing the problem of what's been labelled vaccine nationalism is proving a hard nut to crack. Shortages of medicines and vulnerable supply chains for critical medicines are issues for nearly all developing countries. In Africa in particular, there's limited manufacturing capacity. Over 20 countries don't have any capacity at all. And many regions continue to import at least 95% of their pharmaceutical requirements. For an in-depth look at this story, we're now joined by Professor of Technology Management at the University of Pretoria, Professor David Walwyn. Professor, a very good evening to you. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Globe. Good evening, Simpiwe. Thank you so much. Great. It's great to be here. It's an absolute pleasure having you this evening, uh, Professor. Now, first of all, take us through your case study. Which countries were involved and uh, how was the study conducted? It was quite a complicated study. There were altogether uh, about eight or nine countries involved. Obviously, South Africa and then Nigeria, Kenya, Ethiopia, Ghana, Uganda, um, Tanzania and Morocco. Okay. Uh, just how, uh, how damaging is COVID-19 vaccine protectionism in the developing world, including Africa? So uh, a, a, brief, a brief reply to that, first of all, in terms of the damage. Um, I, I'm not sure how much I need to go into this kind of detail, but the, vari the rate at which variants are produced is very much dependent on the number of infections. And so if the world is serious about cutting down on the likelihood of the occurrence of variants, then they need to, the world needs to ensure that everyone is vaccinated. Otherwise, we're going to have hotspots around the world where there are people, the rate of infection is very rapid and the rate of generation of new variants is very rapid. And the likelihood of an escape variant emerging, in other words, a variant which is, um, doesn't respond adequately to the vaccine or isn't controlled by the vaccine is much higher. And so, I mean, vaccine nationalism is a serious problem for the whole world because uh, the more, the, the greater the number of people who are not vaccinated, the more likelihood there is that a variant will emerge and the greater the chance then that the present vaccines will be ineffective in dealing with COVID-19. And how is this case important for Africa, Professor, especially when looking at the countries like South Africa that have a, a very strong pharma, pharmaceutical footprint? It's a great question. Um, and in a way, I, I partly, I mean, I want to challenge this idea of South Africa has a very strong pharmaceutical footprint because, in fact, South Africa doesn't make any active pharmaceutical ingredients. We do a lot of formulation of pharmaceuticals but we can't make the actual active ingredients on the whole that we use in our medicines. Um, and that then makes us totally dependent on the, um, other countries for, the import, for imports. Um, we import all of these active ingredients. And I mean, I think that's best exemplified by vaccines. So the actual um, the ingredient in the vaccine that causes the immune response, we call it the antigen, um, we can't make any of those antigens in South Africa, even though we have a, a strong pharmaceutical industry. And that's true across the whole of Africa. There are a couple of countries which can make antigens, but um, they, as, unless Morocco is already up and running with their antigen manufacture, no country in, South Af in Africa can make an antigen. So, I mean, the, the, the study is important for all countries in Africa. Um, and it's important for these countries because all countries on, on, in Africa remain dependent for the, the key ingredients of their pharmaceuticals and their vaccines on foreign countries, in countries outside of the region. I mean, why is it though? Why is it that South Africa cannot make those uh, antigens? Is it uh, a capacity issue? I mean, so South Africa is well resourced. Is it uh, human resource limitations or is it infrastructural capacity challenges that South Africa faces that uh, we can't manufacture those antigens? Uh, up until this now, it's, up until, uh, until today, it's really been a case of technology transfer and licensing. So South Africa has been unsuccessful in it in being able to attract a foreign investment which would result in technology transfer um, and then the establishment of local capability for the manufacture of antigens. 
Um, I, it, I mean, an interesting, the BioVac uh, Institute is a good example of this public-private partnership because um, the BioVac Institute has just started making a Sanofi uh, Pasteur vaccine, the hexavalent vaccine, um, but it's actually not making the antigens, it's doing the formulation and the filling, okay. um, which is a more downstream activity in the pharmaceutical value chain or the vaccine value chain. Okay. And so uh, to, to answer your question, then uh, it's uh, a country like South Africa, we need a credible technology transfer deal, which can result in a local company being able to manufacture antigens under license for a large multinational. Okay. Now, according to the study, Professor, over 20 African countries don't have capacity at all. And many regions continue to import at least, what, 95% of their pharmaceutical requirements. Just how detrimental is, you know, heavy reliance on imports, especially at this time of COVID-19 uh, protectionism? So, at the moment, we have a perfect opportunity to see the dangers of this reliance. Um, and I'm sure you've seen these maps of vaccine coverage across the world. And the countries which have got very high rates of coverage are precisely those countries which are able to manufacture these vaccines themselves, with the exception possibly of Israel. Um, but a lot of the countries which have higher rates of coverage, um, as I said, are countries which can manufacture their own vaccines. and. Um, that's then the danger of reliance on imports is that when, when you can't buy a product for love of money because everyone wants it, then countries which manufacture stand first in the queue. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, South Africa, which can't make its own vaccines, neither can Botswana, Malawi or Eswatini or Namibia or any of the countries in the region, we remain dependent on, on imports and we're going to be the last in the queue. We're going to have to wait for our turn um, in terms of being able to access, access these vaccines. Okay. Now, your study also shows that in certain countries, investment and uh, public procurement in the domestic pharmaceutical sector can actually create capacity and markets, as it were. Uh, just how big is this market potential and is Africa exploiting it to the maximum, Prof? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting, so the total population in Africa, as you know, is about 1.2 billion, which is about the same size as India and about the same size as China. The only difference is that China is one country, India is one country, and Africa is 57 countries, or I can't remember how many when I last counted, but say more than 50 countries. And getting alignment between 50 countries in terms of vaccine procurement is a tremendous challenge. Um, if we could pool procurement in the whole of Africa, we would have a very sizable market. And pool procurement is actually one of the recommendations from the study, um, namely that in order to ensure that um, we have a critical mass of uh, demand in the, in, vaccine, in the vaccine market, then we should have pool procurement and more mechanisms for pool procurement. Um, there are examples, very good examples of pool procurement in the world. There is PAHO, which is the pharmaceutical alliance in, in basically in South America, which is a mechanism for pooling the procurement of vaccines in the region. Um, the, uh, the advantages of that is that you're able to negotiate uh, better prices from pharmaceutical manufacturers, but also that you can then establish um, local manufacturing um, based on preferential procurement policies. So preferential procurement policies will be exactly those policies that support local manufacture okay. or at least manufacture within the region. So, the, I mean, the answer to your question is, yes, um, it's the market potential in Africa is obviously big. Um, you know, if we have 1.2 billion people in Africa and each of those individuals needs two doses of a vaccine, that's 2.4 billion doses. Mm -hmm. And for it to establish a critical mass vaccine manufacturing uh, company, you need a market of about 100 million doses. So, so that would be 24 times the market that we would need in order to have viable local vaccine manufacture. Mm. Um, so it's a, it would be a, a good thing to do. You know, the, the market potential is sufficient to support vaccine manufacture. We just have to find the right way in which to do it.
And having said that, I mean, to produce vaccines typically requires technology and uh, it is exceptionally capital intensive and it requires highly skilled personnel and reliable supply chains uh, mechanisms for key raw materials. So as a collective, is Africa up to the task? I, I mean, I think the track record so far tells you quite clearly that Africa isn't up to the task. The fact that we don't have vaccine manufacturers speaks for itself. Um, and that's unfortunate. But I don't think that's necessarily true ad infinitum for the rest of, you know, for the rest, for the future. Um, things can change. Africa has been very successful in certain areas in high tech um, manufacturing or high tech activities, uh, which require highly skilled personnel. So it's, that's not a sufficient excuse, if you like, or a su sufficient barrier to stop um, countries in Africa from manufacturing their own pharmaceuticals and their own vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, that the, the, there are things, though, that we have to get right in the continent, which we don't reliably. And these are basic things, and they are all public goods. In other words, they relate to the kinds of things that states and governments need to provide. And that would be education, that would be um, clean water, that would be reliable electricity, that, um, that would be a port system, a, you know, a rail and port system that works reliably and is low cost. Um, so all of these public goods are, are weakened um, in the continent. Um, I think you know, very few countries can claim that they meet all the requirements for a high level of public goods, a mm. high level of public service. And so I, you know, I, I think apart from the complicated things that you've mentioned, which would be um, the technology and the highly skilled personnel yeah. and the supply chains for key raw materials, apart from those things, we also have to get the basics right. And there's a lot that we can do in that area. All right. Professor David Volwin, the Professor of uh, Technology Management at the University of Pretoria, thank you so much for your time. You do appreciate it. It's a pleasure. All right, that was uh, Professor David Walwin from the University of Technology.